Start right at the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, really. We know chapter 1, he says, in the beginning God created. And uh, last week we looked at the tri-unity of God, <clears throat> how we're made in the image of God. And, uh, well, actually Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, God not only uh, created us and made us in His image, uh, He gave us responsibilities, and particularly to obey the Lord. Verse 28, it says, God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion, uh, like He'd said. Now, God has given us a, a work. And there in, in verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Very good. But you know, at that point, something happened. And if you don't understand this something, you not only won't understand the Bible, you won't understand life. Genesis chapter 3, I, I believe, is, is the pivot of the Bible. And it's very important that you understand what we're going to be looking at this morning in Genesis chapter 3. You'll often get people will ask you, often, if there's a God of love, why did this bad thing happen? Why do these bad things happen? And the answer is exactly here in Genesis chapter 3. And it's very simple to understand. <laughs> it doesn't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. Now let's look at Genesis 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. We're going to look at quite a bit of Genesis 3 this morning. We're really looking at the fall. Uh, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, we'll just stop reading there for the, for the moment. Uh, like I said, to, to understand Scripture, you, you need to understand this chapter. Uh, very important. Uh, sin and death began right there. And if we're going to understand what life is all about, you know, before that there was no death. You know, evolution is based on death. People, things dying and, you know, things, what do they say, it's... In, blood and, and so on that, that has to do with evolution. Well, listen, there was no death before sin came through Adam and Eve. And as a result of this occurrence that we just uh, are reading about here, we inherit a sinful nature, not a good nature. Uh, let me just read to you a, verse, a couple of verses from Romans uh, chapter 5. Yeah, this is so important. Yeah, I hear this contradicted quite regularly, but Romans 5.12, for instance, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Isn't it interesting God blames Adam and not Eve? By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now we can blame Adam, but let me tell you, we welcome sin with open arms. <laughs> because that's our nature. We don't, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Right. I've said it before. You don't have to teach your children to sin. You know, that's, the parent's job is to help them to learn how to, how to do right. Uh, we're not born with a good nature. We're born with a sinful nature. Uh, verse 18 of Romans 5, he says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemn condemnation. Here's the hope. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. That second one is Jesus Christ. Sometimes he's called the second Adam. He's the good one. <laughs> and uh, what a blessing that uh, even though sin came, God has, has sent a Savior. Uh, I find it interesting how we, we fool ourselves in this matter. 
I, I find that most people think they're pretty good. I, I think most of us are like that. We think, well, yeah, if people really knew me, they'd, they'd probably like me. <laughs> but you know, if people really knew us, they wouldn't trust us. <laughs> because we have wickedness in our hearts. Uh, just recently here in the news, there was a young fellow that was playing footy, and uh, a person on the other team was laying semi-conscious on the ground, and he came up and kicked him in the head. Uh, just, just this week, he, was, he had a court appearance because of it, and the dad of that young man said, he's, he's really a good boy. <laughs> and how we fool ourselves. You know, we're, we're not good people who are having trouble, we're bad people who need the Savior. We're people who, uh, who inherit a, a sinful nature from Adam. And it's so important we understand that. In, in this chapter, we're going to look at three truths. Number one, the personality of the tempter. There is an enemy. Secondly, the penalty of sin. And then thirdly, the promised redeemer. There's, uh, we want to we end with hope. But you know, as, as you think about the personality of the tempter, here comes Satan to Eve. Now, number one, he comes as a snake. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but um, Revelation talks about him. Revelation 12 says, That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Now, I, what would you think if a snake came up and talked to you? I don't know. There's a couple of times in the Bible where an animal talks to somebody. One of the funniest is the guy that this donkey talks to him. And the donkey says something, and the guy answer, his answer is, Nay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God's got to have a sense of humor, doesn't he? But this is not a bit funny. Uh, here comes this snake talking to, to Eve. Well, the Bible says it was the devil. <clears throat> Number one, he's tricking her just by his, his appearance. But then what he says, he's a deceiver. When he says in verse 1, Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And he's going he's gonna to mess with the details. You know? And, and that's the way the world does. When people follow Satan, they're going to take the Bible and they're going to mess with the details. And listen, I, I've been studying the Bible all my life. There's still things I don't understand. I'll be honest with you. But I can understand the basics. I can understand about God and sin and salvation and Jesus. And you know, There's a lot of things I do understand. But Satan will want you to mess with the things you can't. Listen, we don't need questions. We need answers. And I can tell you, Jesus is the answer. Satan is a, is a deceiver. We learned a verse last year, uh, but I fear... Let's see, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. How's the next part go? But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. See, that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to make your life complicated. Life is very simple. You either do right or you do wrong. I mean, really. Let's, let's not trick ourselves. Satan wants to make it all look complicated. That's because he's a deceiver. He's like the fisherman. He offers you that beautiful, you know, if you're a fish, worm. <laughs> but he's always got a hook in it. He's a deceiver. Secondly, he's a liar. Verse 4, ye shall not surely die. Well, they didn't die immediately when they sinned, but they brought sin and death, didn't they? We read in Romans 5, 12, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Death came because of what they did. We need to understand, you know, when, when Jesus was talking about Satan, you know, Jesus is all that's good. Jesus is always right. But listen to his estimation of Satan. This is found in John 8, 44. He's talking to some people, and he says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. And then he describes Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning. From the beginning. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Wow, there's no truth in him. Anytime Satan uses the truth, he does it to lie to you. <laughs> when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Satan is the father of lies. One of the first things Revelation lists about people who go to hell, he says, all liars. Why? Because they're following their father, the devil. We need to be people of conviction. You know, as, as Satan came to Eve, uh, he was... Uh, he was uh, a deceiver, he was a liar. We need to be people who know what God has said. People of conviction. When Jesus was tempted, you know about the temptation of Jesus as Satan came to him, he always answered with Scripture. He gave him the truth. We need to be people who not only know the truth, but don't compromise the truth. 
You know, there's, a, there's a lot of the scripture we can understand. You know, God has said, no stealing. If you steal, it's never right. All right? Uh, no lying. If you lie, it's always wrong. No murder. You know, there's just some things God, that are real plain. And God says, this is wrong. This is right. We need to know what it is, and we need to follow it. It does make a difference what you believe. Let me ask you, does the Bible guide your life? Does it make any difference who Jesus is and what he's done? Now, we need to be people who are not following what Satan would have us to follow, lies and, and deceit. Satan is a deceiver. He's also a tempter. Did you notice in verse 6, he'll use whatever will appeal to you. Now let's be honest. There are some things that will appeal to you that won't appeal to me, and vice versa. I, I have never been tempted by alcohol. Just, it's just not something that is attractive to me. So Satan doesn't use that. He uses other things. Now there's people who alcohol is very attractive to them for whatever reason. And Satan will use that. Uh, he uses bait that he knows will work. He's a, he's a good fisherman. He wants to appeal to you physically or emotionally or mentally. A and he's never changed his methods. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, we're not ignorant of his devices. It's not like he pulls a new trick. <laughs> he always uses the same trick over and over again. And we fall for it over and over again. <laughs> we don't have to. Uh, let me read you a couple of verses from James. James 1, uh, verse 13. Just listen. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. You see, Satan knows that. Satan knows the scripture better than you do. And he knows the way to attract you is to go to your lust. Things you're attracted to. And that's the way he works, because he knows he's a murderer, and he wants to murder you. He wants to murder your soul. He'd murder you physically if he could. Now, Satan is a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a tempter. Satan often starts with something that seems small. Oh, that won't make any difference. Or something you can justify. Well, they did this, so I've, you know, with kids, it's always, why'd you hit him? He hit me first. <laughs> you know, we think we can justify it. And as you look at what happened there with, with Eve, you see four, four basic things there. She saw, she desired, she took, and she gave. We don't like to sin alone. We like to get others in. That, that's why people give you such a hard time if you won't drink alcohol with them. They don't want to sin alone. They know it's sin. They won't necessarily say it. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an answer to every one of those. When you see uh, a temptation... Quit looking. <laughs> Look to Jesus. You know, we sing the song, Who alone can save? Uh, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Uh, we need to look to Jesus. Uh, when you desire, when that lust, you know, comes up, let God change your desires. There, there's a wonderful verse in Psalm 37. I remember as a kid, we used to have this on a plaque on the, on the wall in my, in my parents' home. Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. See, if your delight is in the right things, God will give that to you. And God can change your desires. He can change what, what you want. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Well, then she, she took. You know, instead of taking, uh, it's often been said, you can't stop the birds flying over your head you can stop them making a nest in your hair. <laughs> All right, now that's a, a silly way to put it. But what it's saying is you can't stop temptation, but you don't have to give in to it. It's not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin to sin. And uh, <clears throat> instead of taking, Eve needed to turn and walk away and, and to serve the Lord. There, there's a verse in, a couple of verses, 1 Peter chapter 5. This is a very familiar verse, 1 Peter 5, 8. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, that's what Satan is trying to do. Whom resists steadfast in the faith. That's a real key. We resist him in the faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And we all face the same temptations. You're not the Lone Ranger when it comes to temptation. Even the temptation you're facing that's so hard. There's others. And some have had victory. He says, The God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. God can help you. God can help you through. Sometimes we'll fail. Well, then we confess it and forsake it and move on. Listen, Satan wants you to focus on your failure. He wants you to focus on your sin. God says focus on him. Look to Jesus. Well, Eve did all the wrong things. Uh, she, she fell for what, uh, what he had to offer. And we see then the result of their sin, the penalty of sin. Let's look at, at Genesis 3, verse 7. It says she gave, in verse 6, unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Now let me say this. God knew the answers to all these questions he's asking. Have you ever played hide-and-seek with a little kid? Where's Johnny? You know, God knew where they were. God knew what they'd done. But he wanted them to respond. And as God dealt with them, you see so many things that are lost here. It just makes me weep to think of what they had and what they threw away. Number one, their innocency was lost. You ever seen that happen in a child? I mean, it's going to happen eventually. You know, little kids, they're, they're just so precious. They're innocent. Well, that happened to all mankind right there. Instead of enjoying what God had given them, all of a sudden they were afraid and, and, and they, were, uh, you know, they didn't know what to do. Sin brings guilt and shame. Innocency was lost. Fellowship with God was lost. So notice in, in verse 8, they, they hid themselves. Man has been doing that ever since, hiding from God. The God who loves them and, and wants to help them. Blame was born. And we haven't read that yet. Look at verse 12. He, the Lord asked him, what, you know, what have you done, basically? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And they begin to play the blame game. They begin to point the finger. And we're still doing that. You know, people love to blame their parents, or they blame their society, or they blame, you know, whatever. Uh, listen, uh, dealing with sin means to accept responsibility. If you're going to have, if you're going to be right with God, you're going to have to accept responsibility for your life. God knew you'd have those parents. God knew you'd have that situation. God knew you'd look the way you do and have the brain you do. He, he designed you, and He designed you for good. To be right with God, we have to accept responsibility for our, our actions, our thoughts, and even our reactions. And we can't stop what people do to us, but we can, we can let God control how we react to it. You know, I was thinking the other day, it, it could come in our lifetime to where we might be persecuted for Christ. Listen, are we going to curse them and, and shoot at them? And, or, or are we going to be spiritual about it? Are we going to love the Lord? You know, if they take us and beat us like they did Paul and the disciples, are we going to rejoice that we're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name? Or are we going to curse and be bitter against God and, and against society? What are we going to do? We can't just blame others. We need to accept responsibility. We need God to work in our lives. And especially, it brought the curse. And we talk about that, but here it is. Look at with me in verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, 
and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Do you ever wonder why that verse is right there? It's because in Adam all die. Eve is the mother of all living. There, there's nobody existing today who didn't come from Adam and Eve. We all come from the same stock. We can be different colors and have different cultures and so on. We're all related. In Adam and then in Noah. And God knew that. We need to understand, uh, sin brought the curse. A curse on the serpent, a curse on Eve, Adam, on the very earth we live on. You know, it's not like the Garden of Eden anymore. <laughs> You know, we don't just wander around, pick a little fruit off the tree and, you know, lay back and, and take it easy. He said, by the sweat of our face, we're, we're going to live. You know, man resists that. Uh, we don't want to live by the sweat of our face. We want to retire when we're 40. Now, listen, that's, that's not God's plan right now. In Romans, he, he says, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Listen, when you see the trouble in our world, uh, think about Adam. In Adam all die. The, the curse, the whole, the very globe we live on is groaning. You know, you'll hear of an earthquake in one part of the globe, and usually there's a corresponding one on the other side of the globe. It twists, and uh, the curse of God is, is, is on the earth that we live on. Have you ever been asked, you know, why do good th bad things happen to good people? You'll never get asked why do good things happen to bad people. Um, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, number one, God said there's none good but God. That's probably not the best answer to give them at that point, but you need to take them to Genesis chapter 3. Say, so here's, here's why. Will you believe this? The curse came because of sin. In Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. There's hope. There's hope. Sin brought, it, it caused us to lose our innocence. We lost fellowship with God. Blame was born. It brought the curse. It brought death. In uh, Genesis 3 verse 21 and Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now I've found this. If you're going to wear a skin, at some point you've had to kill the animal. We don't, we don't wear them live normally. <laughs> God killed the first animal. And he did it to cover their nakedness because of their sin. Now you can make, make of that what you want, but it, it's very important to understand. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Immediately God began to picture that. And to show that uh, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And then finally, not only uh, did it bring death and the curse and all of these other things, they were put out of the presence of God and their home. The only home they'd ever known. Genesis 3, verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, that's angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Can you imagine if they'd been able to eat the tree of life in their sin? They'd have been deteriorating and unable to die. And God knew that would not be a blessing to them. They were put out of God's presence. How many sins did they have to commit to be expelled? Just one. The wages of sin is death. How many sins would keep you out of heaven? Just one. And you know, the Bible says we're born sinners. Uh, we're born with, uh, with this heritage. Romans 3, chapter, uh, chapter 10. <clears throat> I should know this, this verse. I'm sure I do. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Later on, he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They were put out of, of God's presence. You know, the consequences of sin, they're just terrible. And we try to minimize them and excuse them and so on. But you know, in the midst of all that, there in verse 15 of chapter 3, you see the promise of the coming Redeemer. 
What a blessing. You know, God is never surprised by anything we do. God didn't create us saying, oh, I hope they make it. <laughs> God created us knowing we'd sin. He gave us the perfect opportunity. You know, he knew we'd sin. And already in Genesis chapter 3, we see his promise of the Redeemer. Verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan definitely bruised Jesus' heel in the crucifixion. But Jesus is crushing Satan's head in the resurrection, in the second coming, in eternity. Uh, listen, you can read the back of the book, Jesus wins. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, this is the battle of the ages, Satan versus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> in 1 John chapter 3 and, and verse 8, you know, this, this is not a new thing, and it's not on just because we're there. This battle would go on whether we were there or not. 1 John 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Listen now. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's the battle. And I, if you're going to be on the victory side, you're going to have to be on Jesus' side. The devil will trick you. He'll, he'll try and tempt you and, and offer you things that, that he oftentimes can't deliver. But Jesus... God's Son is the Redeemer. <clears throat> this is the battle. I've been quoting this verse. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Eternal life. Life in Jesus. Uh, the Redeemer has come. Uh, you know, God shed blood to cover Adam and Eve. Jesus shed blood is the only covering for our sins. You know, the, the world tries to invent things different religions, different ideas to, to feel forgiven. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you feel forgiven, it's whether you are forgiven. You can fool yourself into feeling forgiven, but you need to have uh, God's forgiveness. It comes by faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in, in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, it's only through Jesus Christ let me get you to stop and think of the picture that was there as Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. Look there in, in Genesis 3, verse 21. And Adam also and, the, and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. God shed blood. Then verse 24. He drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword. Cherubims are angels. So here's two angels. And as you look past the angels, you see shed blood. That should remind you of something. Have you ever heard of the Ark of the Covenant? Two angels. And in the middle is the mercy seat where the priest would come and, and put the blood. Both of those are pictures. And they're pictures of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the only remedy for our sins. You know, as Adam and Eve looked back, never to go again into the Garden of Eden, they saw the blood. They saw the angels. They saw the mercy seat. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Calvary. The only way to be set free from our sin is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Satan will try to fool you. The world will encourage you to continue the wrong path that you're taking. Jesus calls unto you, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. That's what God wants for you, now and for eternity. In 1 Peter chapter 1, this is such a, a precious verse, I, I so appreciate it. Verse 18, he says, you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. We fight. <laughs> we have to fight what we receive, you know, from our parents and our grandparents and so on. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And listen to the next verse. 
who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Christ died for you. God knew we'd sin. God knew what Adam and Eve would do. God knows what you'll do. And He loves you anyway. And He gave the very best, His, His only Son. Now, we need an adequate covering to approach God. Fig leaves are not enough. Can you, can you just picture Adam and Eve sewing the fig leaves together? How pitiful. And you know, that's just like religion and good works and all the things that we claim. God has to provide the covering. God provided that covering. And it has to involve blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That covering, the covering we need for eternity, is obtained only through the death of Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. God's call to you today is the same as it was to Adam and Eve. As they tried to hide themselves, God graciously said, Where art thou? He didn't have to do that. He knew where they were. Where art thou? And God's call is the same to you. He knows exactly where you are. But His call is, Where are you? You can have rest. You can have forgiveness in the Lord. If you're saved, listen, don't let Satan lie to you. Don't let him concentrate on your sin. Concentrate on God's grace. Concentrate on the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. Concentrate on the things that, that God wants in your life. And rejoice in them. But if you're not saved, listen, don't be deceived. Don't let Satan fool you. He's a liar. He wants to murder your soul. He'll, he'll try and reach you exact, right where you are. He might give you exactly what you want but it won't help you. You need Jesus Christ. Christ is your Savior. Christ is your Lord. What a, what a day it will be when our Savior we shall see. He needs to be your personal Savior. We were saying the other day, God doesn't have any grandchildren. You can't have a relationship through someone else, only through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way to God. Uh, this morning we're going to sing the song, Jesus, I Come. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, listen, make today the day of salvation. Satan will say, oh, do it tomorrow. You may not have tomorrow. If you're a Christian but not right with God, listen, make it right today. Don't look back with regret. Let's, let's go to the Lord.